Yeah, so this morning, uh, for the rest of the morning, we have a couple meta presentations. Uh, George Hathaway has block two, where he will talk about aspects of experiments, particularly low thrust experiments. Obviously, it has a lot of res uh, relevance for several of our discussions this week. Uh, so George will give us some ideas of what to expect in legitimate experiment, and then we maybe can bring that to bear in the subsequent uh, discussions. So for, for as a companion to that, I wanted to put together a quick uh, overview on what constitutes a good theory. Uh, it turns out uh, there's not a lot you can say, but what you can say is profound. So, so this will be short, uh, but again, as we look at theories, we look at experiments, I hope that this gives you some indication of what would constitute a legitimate theory. Okay, please, Robin. So uh, we have two basic situations looking for a breakthrough. One is a theory with no experiment, and one is an experiment perhaps with no theory. So uh, if we can, if you can levitate a cannonball in front of us, we don't care what the theory is, it really doesn't matter. Uh, that's the desired, you know, that's a desired situation. But no one's levitating any cannonballs, and uh, we are in the situation of maybe working from theory towards experiment. So next slide. Uh, okay, did the cannonball thing. Next slide. Okay, so theory with no experiment. That's the focus of this, these few slides here. This is the most likely situation because we're searching for a breakthrough. Where do you search? Well, we might rely on theory. Uh, and so I will uh, talk about some of the aspects of theory that you know, we can use to guide a search for a breakthrough. Next. Um, so I'd like to use the Dickey framework. In the 1950s, uh, Robert Dickey did a lot of work on gravity and general relativity. And, uh, and as they were trying to confirm general relativity, they wanted to sort of generalize it and see if maybe general relativity wasn't the exact right theory, but what would be the quote right theory? How could they uh, contextualize their experimental results uh, within the framework of, uh, of a theory that wasn't necessarily general relativity. And I think what Robert Dickey did uh, is valid for us here today as we look for a breakthrough. Next. Okay, so number one is that the laws of physics, classical and quantum, are covariant. Um, and that means that they look the same written in any coordinate system. And uh, sort of woven in here is the Lorentz transformation. It's how space and time transform between coordinate systems. So uh, the practical uh, implication is that the equations will be written in terms of vectors and tensors. So uh, just by writing it in that form guarantees you get the right transformation properties. But this is number one. If someone writes down an equation that's not covariant as a starting point, well, you know, you're already in trouble. Next slide. So here's some examples. These are all covariant laws of physics. Uh, in the upper left, these are the Einstein equations, uh, the equations of gravity. Uh, they sort of generalize Newton's law of gravity. Uh, these are the Maxwell equations written in covariant form. On the upper right is the geodesic equation. This is the equation of a body moving under gravity. And here's the Lorentz force law, which is the equation of a body moving under electric and magnetic forces. So you can see they all have the little, the indices here. Uh, they, they, these are tensors uh, with two indices, typically called a tensor, one index called a vector but these equations will look the same written in any coordinate system. So this is what we like to see in a new theory. Next slide. These are not covariant equations. So E cross B, uh, del squared phi, uh, F equals MA, not covariant. Now we all sort of live in a in maybe a Newtonian world and we start with the covariant equations and we ratchet them down and then we end up with E cross B, that's okay but it can't be the starting point. It has to be something that is covariant. Next slide. 
Okay, number two, again, this is from Robert Dickey. Uh, there should be a Lagrangian. All of the laws of physics that we know have a Lagrangian. A Lagrangian has been found. Uh, so it would, we expect that any new law of physics, any breakthrough will also have a Lagrangian. Again, if there's no Lagrangian, you're probably in trouble. It's gonna be hard to convince anyone in the mainstream if you don't have a Lagrangian. Now you might say, well, I've proven that Lagrangians are irrelevant or something like that, but then it's a big hill to climb. Next slide. Um, Lagrangian's really interesting. Uh, it's, it's a very, it's a sort of a simple mathematical thing that generates a lot of complexity uh, according to a fixed operation. So I take the Lagrangian for electromagnetism or the Lagrangian for gravity or for electroweak, do the same operations on all of them, get the different equations. So Lagrangian's powerful, but there's no method for finding one, they're guessed, they're discovered. Uh, like, like gold, you dig it out of the ground, you find it, you get lucky. Um, I like the case, uh, Steven Weinberg won the Nobel Prize for guessing the electroweak Lagrangian. If you look at his paper, it's very short. He just wrote it down and, and that was it. So, so Lagrangians are important. Uh, next slide. I just wanted to write down, this is the Lagrangian for all of classical physics. And you can see uh, on the left-hand side, it's just a scalar. There, it, on the right-hand side, it's written in terms of tensors, but it's just a scalar. It's a, one of the simplest mathematical entities. Uh, and this, com this uh, really condensed format captures everything we know about general relativity and electrodynamics. So again, this is sort of what we like to see. If someone has a new theory, we might expect maybe they're multiplying factors, they're introducing factors in these terms, or they're adding additional pieces. I haven't bothered with the quantum Lagrangians, because my view is going to the stars is not a quantum problem. I know a lot of people disagree, but you know this microphone and this spaceship, this building, these are all quantum things. So that's why I like to focus on the classical uh, Lagrangian. Uh, yes, so say. Yeah, I agree that the uh, Lagrangian is extremely important, but the uh, second law of thermodynamics and anything to do with internal losses cannot be uh, expressed in, in a Lagrangian. So, in, even if, for example, if you look at uh, uh, Woodward's uh, experiment right now, the, the internal losses that have to do with the Q, which is, which is the quality of resonance, is uh, the damping. Yeah. That cannot be put into a Lagrangian, those are internal losses. So this is a minimum, I agree, to, to be able to have a Lagrangian for things that are not part of the second law of thermodynamics. But yeah. if you, you have to do more than that, because a lot of what we are dealing with, uh, uh, the second law of thermodynamics, does play an important role as well. Yeah. So yeah, Jose is saying that we have the laws of thermodynamics, conservation of energy, uh, increase of entropy, and maybe a zero through a third, but and those don't have Lagrangians. The uh, entropy. Yeah, increase of entropy. Uh, first one is increase. Conservation of, conservation of energy, of course. Yeah. It has, has a Lagrangian, but the, so, the entropy is the one that doesn't. Yeah, so, I mean, point taken. I, I don't know if you can, if it, they're. I was just going to mention. They're not about particles and fields. These are particles and fields. Second, first law of thermodynamics is not telling you about any particular particle of field. I was just going to mention, in general, Lagrangians have difficulty describing dissipated forces. Right. Which are, exactly. uh, they, it, you have to have dissipated forces to have exactly. a second law of thermodynamics. So right. It's a, it's yeah. a tricky problem. That's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. OK. Uh, next. Oh, I think we're coming to the end. I might just have one or two more, unless this is it. Oh, yeah, concrete prediction. Uh, so, a new theory has a new prediction, a prediction that's not in the existing theory. A new viewpoint, but no new predictions, not a new theory. Uh, so, there's lots of ways to skin a cat. I, and I like the example of Feynman, uh, Richard Feynman. He would always 
derive things in lots of different ways, and then he would invent a few new ways, and some of those, in fact, might have become a new theory. But in general, if you just have a new way of looking at something, but you don't have a new prediction, it's probably not a new theory. Or if you do have a new way of looking at something, you need to find that new prediction. So it's great to have a new viewpoint, but you got to get to the new prediction uh, to, to make it valid. And then, just a minute, Tony, and then falsifiability, a uh, valid theory is falsifiable. That means you can prove it wrong. If you can't prove it wrong, it's generally not accepted to be a valid theory. So I'm going to go to Tony first and then to Peter. Give me an example of a new prediction. A new prediction. Um, well, like in the one I'll show later, that you could adjust uh, the force of gravity, the coupling to gravity. Um, or like, uh, yeah, if I, I have an electromag, if there's a coupling between electromagnetism and gravity, and I could do some electrical experiment and then change the weight of the cannonball, that's not in existing physics. So, so by a new prediction, I mean something that is not known to physics. Now, it may have been in the old physics, like general relativity is really complex. Maybe there's something wild in there that no one's discovered, but generally uh, it's something new to physics, new mathematics, and a new experiment. Um, so like the ultraviolet catastrophe, the old quantum revolution 100 years ago, you know, there was this divergence in the energy, and then Planck made his calculation of the black body spectrum. That was new to physics, even though, and it was verified in experiment. The theory didn't account for that. So basically, it's just finding out something new about the physics you already know. It's a new experiment that is not in the framework of physics. Uh, so I think it's an important point. I don't want to minimize it, but it has to be something that hasn't been seen, and that's probably new physics. It seems unlikely there's something we hadn't seen before that's in the existing physics, although that's what Jim is uh, you know, telling us about. So. so my thing is, is physics is always the same. It's just that we learn more about it. Yes. So the new prediction is something new we've learned about physics that we already know. Well, I mean, to say we, like, do the Native Americans know about black holes? Probably not, but it was there, so but we're talking about our understanding of it. Yeah. And uh, Peter? So, uh, what would your opinion be on the falsifiability of the ring theory, for instance, which is the entire... Well, that's a good example. I think it's not falsifiable, and it doesn't seem valid. Yeah, the whole physics community, not the whole physics community, but the majority of the physics community, you can't become a modern physicist today without sort of paying homage to strict theory. That's true. Yes. And it's not a falsifiable theory. So here we're saying that this, for our, for our intents and purposes, yeah. for reality to be you know, predictable here, it's got to be falsifiable. I 100% agree. Yeah. But so we're saying that the main thing is just right. totally off course, right? And I think that's part of the reason why we're off here on our own. We're not funded by the NSF. Uh, so. Uh, but but uh, also on string theory, I don't think it has a prediction either. So that's also a problem. Uh, I'm going to go to him and then to Martin. Uh, Ron. Ron. <coughs> Ron Turner. I think building on what Tony said, I think, couldn't you say that it's in certain limits reducible to, know, to the known physics to be valid? Uh, no, I mean, if you find something new, like Einstein... Well, I mean, uh, there are certain limits. New Newtonian physics is, you know, you, you, can, you can get Newtonian physics out of modern, out of general relativity or special relativity in certain limits, small velocities. Correct. Limited, small velocities. Yes. So, so what do you think that in order to establish your credibility, you can show that in certain limits, Oh, yeah. It's consistent with... Yeah, maybe I should have had that on there, I'm is you don't turn over the whole apple cart. It has to fit into the bigger picture. Is that your point, Ron? And I think that was also the point Tony was sort of being, at least what, was what I heard at. Oh, okay. I'm sorry if I misunderstood. Well, my opinion is physics never changes. It's just our understanding of physics changes. Correct. Yes. 
And, then, and so now Martin. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, to that um, that uh, there are some predictions in string theory um, that, for example, at 10 minus 17, 10 minus 18, you will see a violation in the equivalence principle. In, in, uh, in the CNES, the French Space Agency, this year they launched a microscope satellite, and they're getting data on that. It's the first space based test for the equivalence principle, and they're going to release the data very soon. So we're all very curious what they will find. So Mark, you're saying string theory is falsifiable? Yep. There okay. is a prediction on string theory where you will see a violation on a principle. And space mission is going on right now to test that prediction. Okay. One, 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 one version of string theory. One version. That's one thing. Oh, yeah. One <laughs> prediction. I'm sure someone else can come up with yeah. a string. At least it's the first experiment I'm aware of where they're really trying to test the prediction of string theory. It's going on right now. Okay. And Jeremiah? I was going to make a suggestion that maybe instead of new prediction, maybe new prediction of an experiment. In other words, instead of being like, well, I can do X, Y, Z with this new viewpoint, you can say, well, if it's a new viewpoint, it should be testable that this is what the results mean. And it's generally in a place that we have either on looking or we don't have a lot of data. I mean, if you were to say gravity is not what it is, it's pretty falsifiable because we're all you know, we're used to testing it. But if it's something that's different, you know, in your cannonball, you have to prove it, but you're not necessarily changing the Lagrangian or anything else. You're saying you're doing it this way, and this is the experiment to see if that is the way it works. And so, you know, when I think prediction, I'm thinking, you know, something more grand, but perhaps it's more appropriate to keep it on a more limited basis. I'm not sure I follow, but limited by what? Or you mean, what do you well, mean? What's the limit? It's the bounds of your experiment. So you can, you can say, I'm going to go test X, Y, Z, but usually you have to say within these bounds. Um, you brought up you know, yeah. Newtonian. Newtonian and general relativity match at low velocities, but they diverge greatly when you get up to high velocities. So your limitation is within these bounds, this experiment is valid. Um, it's kind of like whenever you do a model. It's within these bounds of the model, this is valid. So, I think the new prediction has to have include those. These are the bounds and these are the, the assumptions I'm making to make this prediction. Because you can come up with a lot of viewpoints, a lot of predictions, but it's usually the details that screw you up or make it hard to replicate or make it unfalsifiable because you don't have that information. Yeah. And that's part of what it takes to make the re experiment repeatable and verifiable if they don't. So, okay, George. Yeah, uh, last night is George Matherly. Uh, last night we heard that, uh, or heard about uh, John Brandenburg's uh, theory, new theory that predicted the mass of proton, I believe. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, well, it didn't predict it. Well, it derived okay. it. But it derived, explained it. Would you call that a new prediction? It doesn't have to be a, it, has, it doesn't have to be an experiment. It's something within a, a corpus of theory that is a prediction. It doesn't have to be an experimental, yes. uh, experimentally validated prediction. Uh, You're just yeah. saying uh, it, it is a prediction. Is so it a new approach? It's a new approach, but it's a new approach to, to verify something that's already existing. That right. right. It, okay. It's, right. People say that you've explained where something gets its mass, and uh, so I, I was. Try, I'm trying to be careful not to say that it's a prediction. Well, that's what I'm saying. It, there's but there are I, some of these in the yeah, word prediction. Yes. Yeah. But it doesn't explain reality as we know it in a new way. Uh, but I did predict this new particle uh, at 22 MeV. Yeah. So I, I think George's different. point, though, is a good one. Uh, like the example would be Niels Bohr calculating the Rydberg constant. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so he uh, he explained it. Yeah, right? yeah and. Now, you could invent a formula for the Rydberg constant, potentially, and that might not be as compelling as the derivation Bohr did. So I would take your point, George, that maybe explaining a compelling explanation for something heretofore unexplained would also be a prediction, even if it's separate from an individual experiment. I would point out that the Bohr model, because it explained the hydrogen spectra, um, was a uh, you know considered a watershed event. It also explained then the ionized helium, you know, which was another single electron. So this this 
these were actually recorded things, but suddenly the Bohr model explained them, and this, this was considered a big advance. And, and in that case, in the Rydberg, you know, Bohr had some simple assumptions about quantized angular momentum and then just the Coulomb law. So it was, you know, dead simple to follow it through. Uh, yes. So, okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's my last slide. Uh, Bill, yes. Well, Christy, uh, it's a foundational type of thing. Uh, it's not a stupid question, but we know the space and time are connected. There's lots of evidence for that. But I'm um, just wondering, is anybody working on uh, how or why they're connected? Is it anybody? Well, I think it, it's uh, built into general relativity. Uh, the, you know, the distance between objects or events in space and time is, can be shown to be what we call gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's where it comes. We blame it all on Einstein. So that's where it comes from. Did that answer your question? No. Mm -hmm. it, says, it says there's evidence of it, yes. And I'm just wondering who's person. General relativity works and it's based on that idea, that assumption basically. Yeah. So that space and time or yeah. Yeah. the Lorentz transformation. It really goes back even to special yeah, relativity. Yeah, special relativity. Uh, but time's different for everybody. Tested, you know, so they know you have to use special relativity for the CERN stuff and the GPS and whatever. It's tested every day. It's tested. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the, the motivation was the speed of light. That's what uh, uh, brought the experiment. They showed that the speed of light was independent of, of the, the speed yes. of the mobile sand. And so that links space and time together. Right. And this is what ties it together. This is what, what made Einstein think about, uh, about this. It was the, the experiment that had to do with the, the actually from Michelson, that uh, didn't have a, a, a good theoretical explanation for it. Uh, why is it that the, the speed of light is independent? Any other speed is dependent on the circle. I understand that. And that's interesting because the speed of light is based on the medium through which it travels. And unless you alter that medium, it will be the same for everybody and every reference. Mm -hmm. No matter what speed anything's going at, right? It's right. The medium is still the same. Mm -hmm. So it's locally a theory as opposed to a truly universal theory, which is why the astronomers are looking out cosmologically at the ends of the universe, literally, and they're in different time, they're in different frames of reference, okay? Well, it actually predicted right that the speed of light was different in the case of the universe, right? So if you look further back in time, yep. you see that the speed of light actually is, isn't in there. That's right. Who wasn't in there? Some, some of the constants aren't. Right. <laughs> well, there was a time when the speed of causality was instantaneous. When everything in the, if you were in the Big Bang, um, that's what caused the expansion was causality. Um, things happened without that being prevalent by gravity. I'm sorry, uh, say, say that again. Okay. Michelle? Um, sure. By the Big Bang, it's called the Big Bang. We had the expansion of the universe, correct? Yeah. Where it went extremely fast. That happened faster than the speed of light. The speed of light is determined by causality. Um, events cannot happen uh, faster than the speed of causality. That's yeah, it's tied to, uh, and you know, the speed of light, Jim's got an explanation for it, and uh, yeah, we could really, you know, yeah, unpack that, but. Uh, but I think, yeah, your point that it's uh, related to causality, it, it, you know, is, that's widely uh, accepted. In fact, all Einstein's thought experiments were based on light signals. They could have been based on sound waves, but, but it's the speed of light that does set the scale for causality. That's, so you're saying the speed of light sets, sets the speed of causality? Yes, that's the way I would think of it. Yeah. But who, who knows where the speed of light comes from? Uh, you know, Jim has a nice idea for it, and probably others do. But. So, oh, okay. Let me, let me just say it so that everybody knows what you're referring to. The speed of light in both special and general relativity is what's called a locally measured invariant. It's not a constant. It is a constant in special relativity, but in 
general relativity, if you have a gravitational potential, it's different from the place where you're measuring the speed of light. But you find it's the speed of light where you measure it, not where you are. It's in general different from three times 10 to the 10 centimeters per second. For example, in the vicinity of the event horizon, the black hole measured by somebody who is far away from the black hole, it appears that the speed of light is approaches zero at the event horizon. Isn't that coordinate speed of light? It's in Alba Bazar ship. Mm -hmm. it's, that's the coordinate speed of light. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. in Alba Bazar ship. It's got a very nice explanation. I think someone said earlier that even GPS takes that into account from the signals from the satellite down to yes. Earth. Yes, there's a change in the gravitational field. That's why they have general relativity is actually part of engineering. engineering. Oh, totally. <laughs> Lance, isn't that what you do for a living? <laughs> what? You do, you do GPS and stuff like that too? No. You, you, what, did you do it one point? No. Oh. But um, on the quick study, there is a little synopsis of just this thing about how the speed of light changes with gravity, if you look in the little, one of those quick studies. Okay, is that it on, oh, Tony, yeah. I just want to make an argument against uh, Einstein in general. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if quantum physics had been uh, notarized first, then, then Einstein's physics would have to take into account quantum physics and it would look totally different. And we probably wouldn't be standing in this room today because all our problems would have been fixed. <laughs> Maybe oh, so. Well, it's, I don't know. <laughs> the, the, one of the fundamental problems of, of modern <laughs> physics is you cannot reconcile general relativity with quantum physics. You can't quantize the, the theory. I mean, yeah. everyone has tried to do it can't do it. Yeah. Which, which means the closest it's that the only thing they can do is say that they, at the Planck length you have quantum black holes uh, uh, making and disappearing. Uh, you know, uh, but that's all you can do nowadays. Uh, they, so in but that flip, sense, flip, flip Einstein that concept and, around. What? Flip that concept around and, and consider that the quantum physics was debated first. Now you have to, have to make Einstein's physics match quantum physics. You're trying to make quantum physics match Einstein's physics, is what you're saying. The quantum physics was invented first. It was invented in 1900, 5, 11, yes. 1913, and general relativity was 1915. So, yeah, but it just wasn't, uh, the nail wasn't just put in, tacked to the board first, though. When Einstein's physics came around, everybody forgot about quantum physics for nearly almost 30 or 40 years back. Yeah. Modern, like Heisenberg, Schrodinger, that was 25, 26. GR was 15. It's like a blank body spectrum. GR was recognized as the elevated creation that it was. And then, why would it ignore it? Yeah. There were very few people who do general relativity. And that's part of the problem. <laughs> okay. Because it's also true in the 50s and the 60s and so on. Okay, uh, Jeremiah. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that you were more interested in the, in the general relativity, classical Lagrangians, and things like that. I would caution against ignoring quantum mechanics because it is informative. And we live in a world that, while we deal with microphones, we deal with computers, we deal with a lot of concrete things. They're finding that quantum mechanics also involves itself everywhere we're at. Like the photosynthesis and the, and the leaves out there is all quantum mechanical. And so to ignore the quantum mechanics is probably ignoring the needle in the haystack that we're searching because it's not the right needle. So we need to keep our, we need to not limit ourselves. If it's been proven, we need to include it. Okay. All right. Well, that's it. Uh, so I guess uh, we're done a few minutes early. Our, so we'll have George Hathaway doing the full block on aspects of experiment. Um, and I think we reconvene. Do you think we should just start earlier and bank our... Uh... If we started, have a break now. We yeah. have a 20 minute break. Make sure everyone introduces themselves to each other. Mm -hmm. Maybe start at 10. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, we'll start a few minutes early then.